Anybody remember last week's service? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. God showed up. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, know that God is always here. That's right. He never leaves. Yeah. But that service, I enjoyed it so much, and we talked about the fact that there is another in the fire, right? Yeah. Yeah. That no matter what you're going through, Jesus shows up. That's right. That there's another in the fire to walk you through what you're going through. We got excited. There were lots of amens. There, were, there was lots of shouting. I loved it. We were just a hanky twirl shy. <laughs> really getting this place going. Oh, oh. So, so Bill did have a hanky in the mix. All right. Well, we're going somewhere now. Well, the sermon today is not that. Okay. So we got that out of the way. But it's every bit as much inspired. And God has been impressing upon me the importance of the church. And the fact that over time, just in my lifetime, the church has taken on a different look. And how people view the church and the importance of being here has taken on a different look. Now, those of you that are here that are maybe in your 60s, 70s, 80s, you probably can recall just how much the church has changed in that time uh -huh. yes. and the person's view of it. Well, I had this on my mind and I was watching a National Geographic documentary, which proves that I am aging. <laughs> I remember when my dad would turn those things on. Or anybody ever remember Mutual of Omaha? Oh, yeah. and, uh, Kingdom. And, they, and they would always show the beautiful little deer and it's eating the grass. And you're like, that is gorgeous. Nature is awesome. And then the cameraman would sit there and watch while the lion creeped up on it. Uh -huh. And I always used to scream at the TV when I was a kid. You can see what's going to happen. Intervene for the deer. Do something to save him. But they would just watch and comment as the deer was drugged down and ripped apart. And they would just commentate. So I'm watching one of these. And they were documenting the movements of wolves and their hunting techniques. As the camera showed the wolves circling a herd of elk, the narrator began to explain that the wolves were looking to separate one of them from the herd, which would allow them to attack and kill their prey. Now, the part that got me about this was they, they said that the wolves always go for the sick ones, and it helps pluck them out, and it helps our ecosystem. And I got to thinking about it. These wolves aren't stupid. Like if you went to a buffet and were walking through and you saw a piece of chocolate cake with mold on it. <laughs> and it was a little bit harder to walk to the end of the fresh cake. Which one would you get? So I'm thinking a wolf really does not want the sick elk. I don't think they get the sick elk. So I think they're wrong on that. But the elk were too powerful together. However, if they separated one, it became dinner. Mm -hmm. So I thought the church is much the same way. We need each other, like it or not. Mm -hmm. Amen. God intended it to be that way. So when I hear someone tell me that the church is irrelevant and they can worship God from their porch, all I see is the one that has become separated. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I'm telling you that there is danger in becoming separated. When you are separated from the church, you have now become dinner. So you may think you're on your own now, that you don't have to deal with those people, that you can take all the issues that might happen in a church, that you can shove them aside and get away from them. There are even pastors that leave their ministry because that's their mentality. I have to get away from the people because with people comes problems. Now, I'm perfect, but a lot of people have problems, right? Don't you think it? The church today is faced with an attendance problem. And it comes from the heart. See, there was a day not long ago when illness or family emergencies were about the only thing that constituted being absent. And that has been replaced by whatever the individual deems is more important than church. Come on. That could be golfing. Floating the river, shopping, hunting, or taking some much needed me time, Pastor. 
Don't get me wrong. Vacations and time away are not always a bad thing. They can be necessary. But the question I would ask is, are you taking Jesus with you yep. when you take this break? I spoke with a pastor once who went on a sabbatical. And the sabbatical looked like a lot of fun. <clears throat> but did he take God with him? Was he getting a break so that he might get closer to God? Or was he taking a break from God altogether? Yeah. That's what we have to differentiate. Come on. Are you taking Jesus with Come you? Come on now. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. See, believers should do this without wavering. The Greek word, akmenes, is referring to an immovable disposition. An immovable disposition. That means that your character does not change even though your geographical location does. You're immovable in who you are in Jesus. See, we don't take a break from the values and conviction of the Holy Spirit. We don't take a break from sharing Jesus. You don't go on a cruise and say, so you see someone that's hurting and you say, boy, I would pray for them if I was on the clock. <laughs> And dare I say, we don't take a break from staying sober and presenting ourselves as set apart from this world. I watch people all the time that profess the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That we need to reach people. That we need to be all about ministry. And then they go on a vacation. And they participate in the same debauchery that the world does. They fill themselves with as much as they can get, including the evil word alcohol. You say alcohol is not going to send me to hell. I agree with you. It just might send somebody else. Amen. Because while you're busy partaking in these things, while you're busy being part of the world and taking your break from church, you've left Jesus behind and you've just entered a mission field that needs missionaries. Not party goers. You don't take a break from the values and conviction of the Holy Spirit. No. We're not to be a cheap copy of the original that he created you to be. He created you to be something special. No. He created you for a destiny and for a purpose. You don't retire from ministry until your physical body is officially retired. Mm -hmm. Amen. You don't retire from sharing Jesus because you're tired and it's about time you get those rounds of golf in. You don't retire from ministry because the world says, you're 65 now, get a motor home and go enjoy yourself. One of the things I loved about my conversations with John was he gets a motor home or an RV and he goes to Arizona but you know what he told me? I hope God brings me through this surgery because if he does, it means there's more people in Arizona to reach for him. In his 80s, his focus is how many more people can I lead to Jesus before my physical body expires on this earth? That's what he wants an RV for. Not to go sit in Arizona and not to act like he doesn't know that Jesus that he left behind in plans. Because Jesus belongs in the church. When we allow ourselves to separate our Sunday from our Monday, we become consumers and not contributors. Yeah. We become those people looking to be served by the church rather than serving. We can take the lead from Jesus himself on this matter in Mark 10, 45, when he says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, real ministry is done for the benefit of those ministered to, not for the benefit of the minister. God will give you benefit. God will give you things such as peace and joy and cause you to be happy where you're at. 
So it looks like a lot of work, a lot of people calling your phone, a lot of people complaining about things, a lot of people this, a lot of people that. How can you do that? Because I'm not doing it for the people. I'm ministering because he asked me to. You should minister because he asked you to. No matter where you're at. When you walk into this building, it should be for your growth to not only improve your life, but to affect others. We were not called to go into all the rooms of our house and spread the gospel. <laughs> we were called to go into all the world. Amen. You weren't called to just go into planes and spread the gospel. It's wherever you travel. It's wherever you go. You may think you're going on vacation, but I guarantee you, if you're going to Disneyland and you ask God, will you bring people in front of me that I might minister to them and share who you are? You're going to find a lot of people that need to know Jesus. They're going to bump into you through different circumstances. And you may find yourself on the teacups <laughs> ministering to someone and sharing who Jesus is. And I'll guarantee you one thing. You better not be drunk on the teacups. <laughs> but what does that require? It requires being last, which is something that goes against everything our society tells us. In Mark 9, 35, and he sat down and called the 12. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus challenged us to be last. The desire to be praised and to gain recognition should be foreign to a follower of Jesus. Jesus wants us to embrace last as a choice, allowing others to be preferred before us. I don't like that. That concept is hard for us to grasp because in order to understand it, God must truly be first. Not on a Facebook post, not on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker, but in our hearts. That's right. Amen. Because it will always play out where God ranks in your life. You can have it set up for the perception of the world to see who you are materialistically. And they can look at you and say, I feel like this person is a follower of God. But when tragedy strikes, when something affects your life that is out of your control. If God is not first in your life, you will be a visible train wreck. Yep. And that's what leaves people asking, your God, what's he done for you anyway? Look at you. But you didn't put yourself last and you didn't put God first. So why go to church? It's a question I've had people pose to me. I'm going to give you some reasons. Number one is the church is part of God's strategic plan for your spiritual growth. Let me say before I go into these points, church is not perfect. Right. I'm not perfect. Nobody in this building is perfect. So don't expect it. But I've often heard the statement, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. That may be true. But it's very far removed from God's true plan. It's like saying, I don't need to go to work out at the gym to be a member. That's true. But it's pretty obvious you don't when it's time to lift something heavy in your life. You can, you can waddle across the stage with your gut up to here and say, I don't, I don't need to go to the gym. I've got a membership card. <laughs> Everybody knows you're not going anywhere near that gym. Unless there's a Cold Stone Creamery across the street. <laughs> so don't profess that you're a gym member. You may have the card, you may be a member, but you're not going. Christians do the same thing all the time. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Okay. But when something comes along in your life and there's some heavy lifting to do, or someone comes to you needing help, it's going to be obvious that you can't pick it up, that you can't help them, that you can't even refer them to the help because you've been absent. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 through 25. 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, forsaking fellowship is a sure way to give place to discouragement in your life. Amen. And it will fester where God's people are not encouraging one another. You should be encouraging one another. Amen. Our motivation for fellowship must be to obey God and to give to others. If you come to church to find something wrong with it, then a mirror will do the trick. Put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> Don't come to discourage. Come to encourage. Amen. Come to bring people together because that's God's design. Coming to find things wrong and discourage people, that's <clears throat> Satan's design. Yeah. That's right. To destroy the church. Bringing people together in the church is Jesus' idea, not man's. I've had people tell me before, well, the church is just something that man came up with. Well, you might as well just throw the whole New Testament out. Because it's everywhere that that was his intention. Amen. To unify us. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, 20 through 22. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now in that scripture he's describing the temple in Jerusalem that had an outer area called the Court of the Gentiles. And Gentiles could not enter the temple courtyard. They were segregated from the Jews. But through Christ's work of reconciliation, the Gentiles are brought together with the Jews. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Jesus did this. This was a result because he knew that we shouldn't be separated. He knew that a believer in Jesus, Jew or Gentile, should not be separated. Amen. That we needed to share in the hope that was Jesus Christ. That we needed to share in the fact that he'll return and that we have eternity with him. Yeah. That we need to share in all of his teachings. We can't have division. Amen. Because the enemy is looking to separate you. And as soon as he does, you are done. The church is important. The second, you are who you hang out with. When I was a youth pastor, I could easily see how friends influenced young people for good or bad. Now that I'm a pastor to big people, I can see that tendency is true for them as well. Even adults are influenced by the friends and the people they spend time with. And it's important that we understand who we are spending our time with. We need to spend time with other followers of Christ who will draw us nearer to God. Amen. Notice it did not say we need to spend time with other followers of Christ. We need to spend time with other followers of Christ who will draw us nearer to God. Yeah, right. You may have someone in your life that has been a friend for a long time, but every time you sit down to coffee... Negativity is what comes out. Come on. That's not who you are. Amen. God did not create you to be that. Pray for that person. Help that person. But don't sit and partake in it. Amen. That's right. Because if you do, you rapidly will become part of the diseased end of this pack. Yes. True. Don't get separated. Sometimes the situations will not seem fruitful. Sometimes you will despise the process of being drawn closer to God. 
You may have someone that you don't agree with or a person who doesn't do things how you would do them. Anybody know somebody like that? These relationships will cause growth only if you allow it. Quit looking to be comfortable and start seeking growth. But I'm tired of church. Everywhere I go, it's the same thing with those church people. Here's some food for thought. If you have issues with multiple people, it could quite possibly be that you're the problem. If you can draw out 10 people, this person, 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 this person. I have a problem with all of them. Well, then draw a picture of yourself in the middle because you're the only thing that links them together. I say, that's harsh. I've done it. And I began to realize, you know what? I'm the one with the issue. I'm the one that has to get my heart straightened out because I'm the only thing that brings these people together. We have to stop being discouraged and encourage others. Paul said it like this, Hebrews chapter 3, 13 and 14. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We need the support of other believers if we're truly going to grow in Christ. The third is you need the voice of the church. You need it to counteract all the deception that is crammed into your mind every day. Paul warns us in Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. The fundamental problem Paul identifies is that human rules and traditions are being recommended as necessary supplements to Christ. Do you realize how many ungodly teachers are speaking into your life every week? Internet, news media, Hollywood, music, co-workers, friends and family. The list is never ending. With so many messages streaming into your life every week that can kidnap you and take you away from God. It's extremely critical that you spend as much time as possible to fill your mind with godly wisdom Amen. and discernment. Soak in all you can, whenever you can. Amen. Americans spend more time than ever watching videos, browsing social media, swiping their lives away on their tablets and smartphones. American adults, according to Nielsen, on average, this may not be you, but go ahead and cut the numbers in half if you would like. American adults spend more than 11 hours per day watching, reading, listening to, or simply interacting with media. That's up from 9 hours and 32 minutes just four years ago. So that's over 4,000 hours a year. Let's say you read your Bible and prayed one hour per day every day of the year without missing. That's 365 hours a year. Let's give you a two-hour credit for church services of which you attended every last one and did not sleep through. <laughs> That's an addition. I see some people going. <laughs> That's an additional 104 hours. And I'm going to throw in another 100 hours of miscellaneous bathroom study time because I'm nice. <laughs> that would give you 569 hours a year focused on God and growth. That would place the average American spending 3,531 hours more on media than God. Oh, wow. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, with those numbers in mind, please tell me why you need a break from church and not a break from your TV or your cell phone. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. With those ty that type of disparity in the numbers, why is it that people need a break from church? Why is it that people need a Sunday off so they can take in more media? Come on. You say, well, I, I come to the church, 
And it's the same thing every time. Chuck's going to get the microphone. He's going to walk up here. Praise God. This is your house. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then we're going to do the welcome this, welcome that person. This person's sick. This person came home. And, and, and then we're going to go through the announcements. We're going to take the offering. God's will. It's so routine. If you think that way, you're not seeing it through the lens of your Savior. Right. See, you didn't come here to be a contributor. You came here to be a consumer. That's right. And the consumer says, change your advertising. A consumer says, change up your commercial. Yeah. A consumer says, I've already seen that episode. A consumer says, I want something different. I've heard that song too many times. A consumer says, I don't want to walk through this pattern again. I've already been there. But a contributor says, praise God I'm alive. Yeah. Praise God there's breath in my lungs. Praise God I'm free to worship yeah. you today. Yeah. Praise God that Pastor Chuck's healthy enough to get up here and gab on the microphone. Yeah. Praise God that I have enough gas in my gas tank to get here. Yeah. Praise God that I can simply be in your presence and focused on you. Yeah. That's what a contributor says. Yeah. You're either a consumer or you're a contributor. I have been a consumer in my life, and I will never go back. Amen. I watch people preach, and some people are my cup of tea, and some people are not. But never again will I sit and think to myself, this person's boring, or I can't get anything out of this. Because that puts me as a consumer. It takes every piece of God's body to work this thing out. Right. And while it might not be your cup of tea, if you're not paying attention, you may miss something God wants to tell you. Yes. Amen. Every, this quote from Norman Mailer, every moment of one's existence, one is growing into more or retreating into less. One is always living a little more or dying a little bit. As the worship team comes up, the fourth and final point. Ministry in church helps to build up your spiritual muscles. That's right. In Ephesians 4, Paul says that we are all gifted in different ways. When we use our own particular gifts to serve within the church, it is like a body with many body parts that all work together for a common goal. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It takes Everyone working together. Don't ever discount someone's impact for the kingdom simply because it's not how you would do it. Some like speakers who are quiet. Some like those who are loud and animated. Some like hymns and some like modern worship. Some like teaching and some like group discussions. And they all have their place. But if you shut yourself off to the parts of the body that are unappealing to your flesh... It will never work together as God intended. Arrogance will cause it to fall. And you will become separated. And that is a dangerous place to be. Church was designed by God. Do not allow man to cheapen its value. And don't allow yourself to get separated where the enemy can take you down. Because if you do not attend church and you are not in the house of God and you are not with other believers that you love and other believers that you don't care for, 
you won't have growth. You can worship Jesus from your porch. You can go out in the middle of the woods and worship Jesus. But he didn't intend for you to live out there. Amen. He intended for you to come together as a family, like-minded with other believers and challenge yourself to grow. Amen. We settle all too often and the enemy will trick us into thinking that somehow we're first and this life is about us. It sometimes makes me mad. It sometimes hurts my feelings. When I hear people talk about church as if it's just an optional thing, that it's just a place, that it's just a tradition, that it's just walking through the motions. Because when you go to a service, and I'm not saying this so you'll think this about me. There are thousands upon thousands of pastors today giving words. Teachers teaching Sunday school. People filling the roles that they were designed to fill. But it hurts sometimes when I think of the work, the time, the sacrifice that it takes. To hear from God. To get your life lined up. So that you might share it with others. Just to have one stare back at you. Wondering when lunch is. Now I don't say that so that you can make me feel good about myself. For getting up and preaching a sermon. Because I was one of those people that wondered when lunch was. I've sat in the same chairs. We've had these chairs a while. I've sat in these same chairs. And wondered when the service was going to be over. I took for granted some of the teaching I was listening to. I took for granted what God wanted to communicate with me. And what he wanted me to do in my life. And many times I found myself separated from the group. And wondering why I was under attack. Boy, the enemy's really on me. I don't understand why the devil's doing this to me. I don't understand where God is in this situation. Well, the enemy probably doesn't even know what's going on. See, he can't be everywhere at once. He's not omnipresent. But he is a good study on how human beings work. He knows where you're going to walk. Set a trap. 200 years later, somebody's going to walk into it. Because it's what we do. And God never went anywhere. He remained in the same exact place. I was the one that wandered. That's right. But do me a favor. If you sit under anyone's teaching preaching, Sunday school, anything in the future for the rest of the time you're on this earth, please do not take for granted what went into delivering that word to you. Amen. Because it's not about sitting and taking some hours and writing out a lesson. It's about being beat up, being drugged behind the truck face down on a gravel road, being down to your last dime, being challenged at every moment Walking through sickness, walking through illness, walking through the loss of loved ones, and somehow keeping your focus and saying, I'm going to make this about you, God, and not about me. So every time you don't listen to what God's saying, you're saying what you have walked through to get to this point doesn't matter to me. And I will never, ever forget that. I've sat and listened to people since that I would not classify as speakers that I really would care for the style. But I will sit on pins and needles and write down every word they say because it's from their heart and that God has given it to them. That's right. Amen. If we start acting like the word of God matters and we start acting like his church matters, then we'll start seeing his body work together in unison. And when that happens, the glory of God is revealed. Amen. When I ask people to come speak at this church, I don't do it based on who I feel is going to be the most dynamic. I do it 
based on who the Lord is telling me to bring in because of their heart. That's right. And you cannot replace the value of that. Right. Don't get separated. Don't be a consumer. Stay with the church, good and bad, pretty and ugly. Stay with the church and be a contributor. Heavenly Father, praise and glorify your name. Father God, I ask this morning, put your arms around these people, Lord God. This is a family right here at Church on the Move. Father, put your arms around us and pull us in. Teach us and show us in this upcoming week, Father, what role we have to play. What is it you expect of us, Father God? Let us begin to love your church. Let us begin to erase all politics out of it and whatever makes us comfortable and put our eyes on you and love your church. Amen. Father, show us how to do it better. Challenge us every day because we know how mighty you are. We know you are for us. We know that you love us and we know for a fact that you have had your hand upon this place. You are taking us to new places. You are taking us to new heights that you always have known we can achieve. Help us to know it. Help us to understand it. And help us to embrace it. Father God, I pray over these people. Keep them. Love them. Speak to them. Answer their prayers and show them what they can accomplish through you. Let us become dependent upon you. Let us truly become your church. Father, we will give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.